Mark Richards, and for today's presentation, we're going to look at the HTTP performance showdown between the Linux kernel and DPDK. So a little bit of housekeeping first. I'm currently a performance engineer on the AWS benchmarking team. But this project was completed when I was a self-employed consultant before I joined AWS. So of course, it goes without saying, views expressed here don't reflect those of my employer. A few quick things about me. I recently moved from Jamaica to Toronto. And Toronto has been pretty good so far. It's a great city and the summer was lovely. But I suspect I might question the wisdom of that decision when winter rolls around. I come from more of a DevOps engineering background, but I've really gotten into performance engineering in the last few years, and I'm particularly interested in performance in the cloud, hence the new job. So after I spoke at P99Conf last year, the folks at SillaDB contacted me to see if there were any areas of mutual interest that we could explore. My last experiment focused on optimizing everything from the kernel down to the application for extreme HTTP performance. And it made me curious about how that approach would compare to a kernel bypass approach. So the DB was interested in this as well, so they sponsored my work on this project. So kernel bypass technologies like DPDK do exactly what's written on the can. They allow you to bypass the kernel's networking stack entirely and send incoming data directly from the networking driver to the user space application. It's then up to the application to implement or not implement the features that the kernel normally provides. This includes things that we normally take for granted, like support for the TCP protocol. The kernel bypass approach really shines in scenarios where a minimal set of features are needed and the performance is of the utmost importance. For example, you might have a CDN that's using a custom algorithm to drop packets that look like they're coming from a DDoS attack. You can do that much more efficiently with a streamlined and specialized application. But kernel bypass can also be used in more traditional applications like HTTP servers. So, but in that scenario, it's up to the application to actually implement the entire TCP IP stack as well. Now, bypassing the kernel can open up a whole new world of high throughput and low latency. And depending on who you ask, you might hear that you'll get as much as a 5x performance improvement. However, the truth is that most of these comparisons are done without much optimization on the kernel side. So the Linux kernel is designed to be fast, but it's also designed to be multi-purpose. So it isn't perfectly optimized for ultra high speed networking by default. On the other hand, kernel bypass technologies like DPDK take a single-minded approach to networking performance. An entire network inf interface gets dedicated to a single application and aggressive busy polling is used to achieve low latency. So for this project, I wanted to know what would the performance gap look like when a finely tuned kernel goes head to head with kernel bypass in a no holds barred fight. Now, some might suggest that bypassing the kernel is necessary because the kernel is slow. But in reality, a lot of kernel bypass performance advantages come not from bypassing the kernel, but from enforcing certain constraints. As it turns out, many of these advantages can be achieved while you're still using the kernel. By turning off some features, turning on others, and tuning the application accordingly, one can achieve performance that approaches kernel bypass speeds. So I'm going to use a simple HTTP benchmark to do a head-to-head -head performance comparison between a Linux kernel's networking stack and a kernel bypass stack that's powered by DPDK. Now, DPDK is a popular kernel bypass project that was created by Intel in 2010 and donated to the Linux Foundation in 2017. I'm going to run my tests using CSTAR, which is an open source C++ framework for building high performance server applications that's sponsored by SillaDB. Now CSTAR supports building apps that use either the Linux kernel or DPDK for networking, and it implements its own TCP IP stack when you're running in DPDK mode. So it's a perfect framework for doing this type of direct comparison with as little extra work on my end as possible. <clears throat> so similar to my last experiment, this one was done in the cloud, and specifically, it was done on AWS. I used a four CPU instance on the server side, and both the client and the server were in the same cluster placement group to guarantee low network latency. The benchmark itself is pretty simple. It's based on the tech empowered JSON test, and it just expects the server to return a hello world JSON object. Now, I want to be upfront and mention the fact that I cheated a little bit on the server side. CSTAR's built-in HTTP parser was being a little bit finicky, so to keep things simple, I just implemented a basic TCP server that returns a hard-coded HTTP response to any request. 
So it's a fake HTTP server, but serving a real HTTP workload. And this experiment is really about comparing the two different networking stacks to see how they handle this extreme workload. And from the perspective of the networking stack, the networking hardware, the AWS infrastructure, this still looks like a real HTTP workload. Now, before I go any further, I just want to point out that this is essentially a Cliff Notes version of the experiment. And if you really want the full story, you can visit my blog at talawa.io and read a more detailed post there. So I'm going to start off with the DPDK networking stack first, getting as up, get things as optimized as possible there, and then switch over to the kernel side. Now, it was a lot of trial and error for me to get CSTAR and DPDK working with AWS initially. I won't go into all the low-level details, but there's still a couple things that I want to note. <clears throat> For one, CSTAR uses an older version of DPDK that needs a backported fix to address a conflict with the ENA driver. On top of that, AWS has its own ENA driver patches for older versions of DPDK as well. To make my life easier, I forked CSTAR's DPDK repo and applied all these patches there. So eventually, I got everything up and running with DPDK as the underlying networking stack. And as you can see, DPDK performance clocks in at an impressive 1.19 million requests per second right out the gate. So here we have a CPU flame graph of our initial state. And if you're not already familiar, flame graphs provide a unique way to visualize CPU usage, and they can help you identify your application's slowest code paths. Now, even without recognizing any of the function names, a quick look at this flame graph is enough to see that the ENA transmit packet functions is suspiciously large, weighing in at 53% of the total flame graph. It's the one right in the middle in yellow there. Luckily, the solution is something that's documented, but it's pretty easy to miss for newcomers. So first, a little context. In order for the kernel bypass to work, you actually need a kernel module like VFIO to expose the network device directly to user space. Now on newer EC2 instances, the network driver supports a low latency queue mode for improved performance. But for instances that support this LLQ mode, you also need to enable write combining for the VFIO module, or you won't get the level of performance that you actually expect. Now the VFIO module doesn't support write combining by default, but the ENA, ENA team provides a patch, so I made use of that. As you can see, enabling write combining is a big win and it moves throughput from 1.19 million requests per second to 1.5 million requests per second, which is a 27% performance increase. Our flame graph now looks a lot more balanced and the ENA transmit packet function has dropped from 53% of the flame graph to a mere 6%. So DPDK has thrown down the gauntlet with an absolutely massive showing um, 1.15 million requests per second on a four CPU instance is huge. So the question is, can the kernel even get close? Now, starting with an unmodified Amazon Linux 2022 AMI, the server's performance when using the kernel networking stack is around 358,000 requests per second. Now, in absolute terms, this is actually still really, really fast, but it's definitely underwhelming by comparison. So we definitely have some work to do. So I'm not going to go into all the details about the OS changes that I made. They're very similar in nature to the tweaks that I did for my last optimization project. But here's a quick summary. So I start off by disabling speculative execution mitigations. And obviously, this is not a general recommendation. Security is a nuanced topic. But we're going to gloss over those details for today. Next, I con configured receive side scaling and transmit packet steering as the first step towards perfect locality. Now, to get perfect locality, we need to create distinct silos where each CPU gets paired with a dedicated network queue. And the OS and the application are configured so that each silo operates as independently as possible. And on the application side, this is basically a thread per core model. But we also want to make sure that the kernel is configured for it as well. This focus on data locality improves efficiency by maintaining CPU cache warmth and eliminating lock contention. Now, this is something that many DPDK applications do by default, but it has nothing to do with kernel bypass. Similarly, most DPDK applications use busy polling rather than interrupts to process incoming packets. Now, we don't want to inter uh, eliminate interrupts completely, but we do want to drastically reduce the number of interrupts. And we're going to do that using interrupt moderation 
which lets us delay interrupts for a short period of time and then raise a single interrupt to process all the packets that arrived in that period. Additionally, the kernel has a busy polling setting that lets you opportunistically pull the network queue instead of waiting on interrupts. So, as you can imagine, when you combine this with interrupt moderation, you can get a virtuous cycle where you're either preemptively polling for data or processing that data in your application and almost never actually getting interrupted. It's really important for me to highlight the extent to which perfect locality, interrupt moderation, and busy polling all work together. Take away any one of the three and the benefit is much less pronounced. The last few optimizations are much smaller, um, disabling raw sockets used by other pro programs, tweaking GRO and congestion control settings, and a few kernel 515 specific parameters. So our OS optimizations take throughput from 358,000 requests per second to a whopping 726,000 requests per second. That's a solid 103% performance improvement. So we're still far behind DPDK, but we're off to a pretty good start. So the OS level changes to enable perfect locality don't actually have their full effect until the application is configured as well. SO attach reuse port is a socket option that's available in newer kernels <coughs> that lets you distribute network connections using a custom BPF program. Using this option, we can guarantee that the same CPU that handled packet processing in the kernel will also be used when the data gets passed to the user space application. But after making that change, I only saw a 2% performance improvement, which is way below what I expected. I also didn't see any evidence of busy polling, which was a strong indicator that something was wrong with my setup. <clears throat> so perfect locality requires deliberate control over CPU pinning for the main application threads. Using a BPF trace script, I discovered that even though CSTAR's reactor threads were started sequentially, it was pinning the threads to the CPUs out of order in an attempt to spread them across physical cores. So I made some modifications so I could fully control the pinning, and it helped, but I still only saw a 6% boost. And more importantly, I still wasn't seeing any busy polling happening. So I had to dig into my bag of performance analysis tools again to see if I could figure out what else was going on. Um, but running a 10 second syscount trace produced some enlightening results. So syscount is a BCC script that counts the number of times that a syscall is made, and it's good as a high level sanity check. When I ran it, I immediately saw that epoll weight was being called way more often than I, ex than I expected. So the epoll weight syscall um, waits for events associated with file descriptors. In our case, those descriptors represent TCP sockets, and each event indicates readiness to send or receive data. The epoll weight syscall is also where busy polling happens. If there are no events available, the system tries to busy poll for a few microseconds to see if it can pull down any new packets. As it turns out, the C star framework was calling epoll weight with a timeout of zero, meaning, meaning it wasn't waiting at all, which is why we weren't seeing any busy polling. <clears throat> So of course, I needed to change that, but to strike a balance between the framework's latency expectations and my performance goals, I settled on a timeout value of 100 microseconds. And FYI, these changes were also done in a private fork of CSTAR. So now with those three changes in place, performance has moved from 726,000 requests per second to 915,000 requests per second. That's a solid 26% jump and much more in line with expectations. Looking at the flame graph, you can see that busy polling has finally kicked in. You notice that in the after image, it has fewer of those spiky towers and there's now this large block over on the right side of the image. The scattered spiky towers are interrupt driven packet processing and the block on the right represents busy polling driven packet processing. So we're definitely in much better shape. I continued searching for other ways that CSTAR might be doing something unexpected by looking at different performance metrics and comparing them to my previous setup using LibReactor. Sure enough, when I looked at context switching, I saw some interesting numbers. TCP HTTPD was doing around 17,000 context switches per second compared to less than 300 for LibReactor. My investigations led me to the timer threads that CSTAR creates for each reactor thread. At first, I hadn't paid much attention to them since I wasn't using timers and they were barely visible on the flame graph. But in light of the context switching numbers, I decided to take a closer look. And after looking at the code, I realized that the timer threads were used to interrupt the task on the main thread so that it didn't re hog resources. But for this specific workload, the context switching was negatively affecting performance. 
Now, C style lets you pass in a value to control how often the main thread is interrupted. By default, the value is 0.5 milliseconds, but I found 10 milliseconds to be a more reasonable value for this workload. Once I did that, the number of context switches dropped dramatically from 17,000 to about 1,300. Throughput moved from 915,000 requests per second to 964,000 requests per second, a 5% improvement, which is pretty significant for such a small change. This is also a good reminder that there's going to be things sometimes that don't really show up in a flame graph, but still impact performance. Now, back when I was optimizing LibReactor, I realized that for sockets, it's a little bit more efficient to use Linux's receive and send functions than the more general purpose read and write. Usually the difference is negligible. However, when you move beyond 50,000 requests per second, it starts to add up. Now, CSTAR was already using send for outgoing data, but it was using read for incoming requests. So I switched to receive instead. And then I found the final optimization by just roaming around the code base and switching things on and off just to see what they did. I noticed that there was a batch flushes option that was designed as an optimization for RPC workloads, but it doesn't really provide any benefit for this workload and it actually adds a little bit of overhead. So as a quick fix, I just disabled it. Again, this is a micro optimization, not useful for most workloads. I should also clarify that for all these application changes, they were also applied on the DPDK side. I just didn't want to go over them twice. So the final two changes give us a 4.4% performance boost and a nice round 1 million requests per second using nothing more than the good old Linux kernel. In the end, DPDK still maintains a solid 51% performance lead over the kernel, but whether that's a lot or a little depends on your perspective. The way I look at it, when you compare the unoptimized and optimized version of the kernel and application, we've narrowed DPDK's performance advantage from 4.2x to just 1.5x. Now, DPDK's 51% advantage is still nothing to scoff at, but I would be remiss if I sent you down a DPDK rabbit hole without adding some disclaimers about DPDK's challenges. To start off, it's a bit of a niche technology, so finding articles and examples can be very challenging. And bypassing the kernel also means that you bypass its time-tested networking stack and rich ecosystem of existing tools for securing and monitoring your traffic. Also, if you use poor mode processing, your, your CPU gets pegged at 100% utilization. And in addition to not being very energy efficient and environmentally friendly, it also makes it very difficult to troubleshoot your workload just using CPU as a gauge. At the end of the day, it's about balancing your priorities and making the right choice for your specific use case. So we've demonstrated that even when the OS and the application are optimized to the extreme, DPDK does still have a 51% performance lead over the kernel networking stack. But instead of seeing that difference as an insurmountable hurdle, I see it as a, the gap as an unrealized potential that's on the kernel side. It simply raises the question, to what extent can the kernel be further optimized for these types of applications without compromising its general purpose nature? DPDK gives us an idea about what's possible under ideal circumstances, and it serves as a target to strive towards. Even if the gap can be fully closed, it quantifies the task and highlights the obstacles. One very obvious obstacle is the overhead of the syscall interface when you're doing millions of syscalls per second. Thankfully, IOU Ring seems to offer a potential solution to that challenge, and I'm particularly excited about the recent waves of, wave of networking-focused optimization that it's gotten. It remains very high on my list of things to test real soon. So, that's it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. I also just wanted to quickly mention that the AWS benchmarking team is hiring for multiple positions and at multiple levels. If you're interested, you can feel free to DM me at, on Twitter at Talawa Tech or reach out to me via the contact page on my website, talawa.io. Thanks again and take care.